afternoon, everybody. So let's uh, start uh, the 10th edition of uh, Light On. Uh, we are going to close uh, the 2017 with a special guest, with uh, Jenny Gang from uh, Chicago. That she's a founder of uh, Studio Gang, uh, uh, and she has been, uh, after uh, no, our invitation, uh, uh, find the possibility to come to Recanati, and then it has been already to Max. I want to thank you as well, people Chora, that uh, uh, with us has been working uh, and cooperating this uh, interesting project for uh, two years. Um, and we are really happy and really proud to have uh, Jenny uh, today in Recanati, in this little, little corner of Italy. Uh, first of all, we are quite happy because as well, uh, as you probably know, our vision is social innovation through light. So we think that lighting can make uh, a substantial innovation in our life. And uh, as well, uh, in Jenny Vision, architecture is quite important because uh, all the times when we design a building, we think uh, about a space, uh, we always need to understand how uh, the space interacts with, you know, with the environment, with the people, and uh, with the communities around. So that is vision is quite similar, so we are really uh, pleased that, uh, that you are here. And uh, I'm going to leave the stage to uh, people that is going to make uh, a better introduction about uh, Jenny work, and then I'll leave the stage to Jenny that is going to make the masterclass to all of us. Thank you very much and good evening. Va bene, I am very happy to welcome Ginny Gang in uh, Recanati. I'm very happy that Guzzini is doing with us this project. I'm very proud that we are bringing here interesting people and, and extremely interesting architects. I'm very happy that Ginny had the possibility of seeing in these two lectures and also in these days she's spending at the American Academy, uh, the two Italys. There is an Italys of cities like Rome, Milano, Napoli, which is interesting, which is certainly beautiful, attractive, uh, full of things and full of memories, a lot of, a lot of memories and also some chaos. Uh, but also there is a city of territorio. There is, a city made of, there is an Italy made of its territory which is extremely productive, as you saw probably here today, and you're sitting on another important company from this area, uh, which is a city made of landscape, urbanization, history, uh, which is sometimes in our country even more progressive and more productive uh, than the cities. I mean, it would have been extremely more complicated for me to, uh, to build such a partnership with a company in Rome. It was kind of natural. Here, here in an area where my school is, where they work, where our students come. Very, there are here a number of students who are doing uh, internships in the company. So it's a very intense and productive territory. So I'm very happy you could have this double experience in two days. Uh, the next thing is to tell you who Ginny Gang is. Ginny Gang is a really an important architect. And I'm also very nice that the last person we had here was Peter Eisenman a few weeks ago. So this legacy of the 70s, conceptual, very tied to the Italian tradition somehow. Uh, but, uh, and also something which is a person in the present architecture, but also a witness of a different time in architecture. Today we have an architecture of the present and of the future. Uh, Ginny Gang coming from Chicago, so an architectural tradition we always admired. Uh, a leading architect in her country and internationally. So really a very good opportunity and I like also this diversity from the last episode we had here. Ginny studied at the University of Illinois. Then she had, I think, like a visiting experience uh, in, in Europe, in Switzerland, ETH, uh, LETIAC. Uh, then completed her education at Harvard. Then she, as many of these important architects of her generation, she had an experience at OMA in Bremkula Studio in, in New York, uh, mostly, no, in Rotterdam, in Rotterdam. And then she opened up her, her, her own office, Studio Gang, in Chicago in uh, 1997. Uh, after that, uh, Jean is also a teacher because you had many teaching experiences in Harvard, Columbia, Rice, Princeton and Yale, and she won so many awards that I'm kind of uh, ashamed because we never get one. Uh, that she, she's, she's been the architect of the year in America. She got the Louis Kahn Memorial Award. She's a MacArthur Fellow. I mean, she's, we are, really have to be honored to have her here. 
But Ginny is mainly a designer. She is really a designer. I'm very happy that our students can have this, uh, and our fellow architects have this opportunity to, to get in touch with their work, because maybe in Europe we don't know it enough yet. We should have known it if you get that tower. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, you would see some beautiful t uh, projects by Gini. More, uh, I mean, more, more many of them in the Chicago area, but also growing up around the world. I think we, we, we're very familiar with this beautiful tower, the Aqua Tower, which is a, uh, a tower negotiating the relationship between the human, the wind, and the city. Uh, we, before that, we have a very nice theater, the Starlight Theater in... Uh, in a college, uh, still in Illinois, I think. And then these two beautiful bathhouses, you must have both houses, you must have a, an attention, a specific attention to both houses. Due, come dire, due, come si chiamano, club marittimi, no? A, a Chicago, where you go to Raw, dove si va a remare. Uh, housing, so there is a very diverse set of experiences, so it's very good. But we have this chance. There are two interesting, uh, also low cost, in some kind, um, uh, housing projects: the, the the city, the city high park, and solstice in Chicago. Uh, then there is a beautiful project she will tell us about, which is extremely interesting in Italy. I think this Center for Social Justice, il Centro per la Giustizia Sociale, at uh, the College of Kalamazoo. And then uh, also a project I'm very much in love with, which is the theater, the, the Writer's Theater. And also there are pro ongoing projects, right? the, this, the, this part of the National History Museum, this, this, uh, this other tower in, in Chicago, and, and, and many other stories she will, she's going to tell us. I'm, I'm very glad, I think, for our, I mean, like kind of, this is also a seminar, no? It's this live. It's a lecture and a seminar at the same time. I think Ginny for us, for me, it's relevant because she's, keep, she's very good in keeping an architecture tension in this kind of serious approach to environment, to, to nature. She positions, she put architecture in the perfect position between man and nature. And I think this is a very good point for her work. And I think she also will tell something about this. The other, the other interesting thing, I think, is this, this ability in, in working with different scales. I mean, uh, she, there are projects that work at a very small scale. There are projects that are big towers. I mean, she's a Chicago architect. She has towers in her soul. Uh, but at both scales, you have a very clear sense of what the human presence would be. So this flexibility and versatility, can, can you say that in English? In, uh, in, in managing different scales is, is another beautiful, I think, aspect of her work. And then, yes, this idea that this legacy of Chicago, for us, I mean, New York is a, is a, is a European city, you know? Uh, California is a Mediterranean city, place. Chicago for us is really the other, no? Chicago is a different architectural tradition we've always been in love with. We consider like one of the big roots of modernity. And so it's nice to see how it developed and it's going to design its future in your work. Grazie, Jim. Thank you, Pippo. Nice introduction. Grazie, buonasera. Tonight I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about not only the work, but why we do the work that we do. So show you some of the work, but give the reason behind the work. Um, Studio Gang is a practice that is very collaborative. Um, we, we make things together, physical things. Uh, we, we have a strong culture of togetherness in our office. Uh, we have about 100 people in, located in New York and Chicago, but despite the different locations, we work together on our projects um, from these places. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, my own background and how maybe some of the ideas came into the work. Um, where, where I grew up, my, I grew up in the middle of the America with um, a family that my father was a structural engineer and a civil engineer. 
So he designed roads and bridges. And so for our family vacations, we always went driving in a car like this across the country on the roads to go see bridges. <laughs> um, so really the longest bridges, the shortest bridges, the tallest bridges. Um, so that's where I think I got a love of infrastructure, I guess. But, but also at the same time, I saw um, the, the landscapes, the landscapes throughout America, which really inspired me. Especially a place like this one, which is Mesa Verde. It's, it's a, it was a city of um, Pueblo Native Americans who built, used the materials they had on hand and built together with, with nature and the ecology. The ecology in these areas was very diverse. So they had a big impact on me as well. As an architect, I'm interested in the city, of course. Um, many times people think that cities have the negative impact on, the, on nature. Um, some cities do actually impact nature. This is a photograph I took from a plane showing, coming into Chicago and showing how the heat of the city and the, the, the heat of the city actually scrape the clouds. So the skyscrapers are actually skyscraping in this picture. Um, but at the same time, um, I think cities are also a place that supports life. Um, and so not only human life, but also ecological um, life and habitats. This drawing shows uh, the city of Chicago up in the, in the far right corner. And all of the industrial areas to the south, um, the red titles are places that, were, that are actually industry still working, but um, overlaid with this migratory bird path. So you can start to see the relationship between water, natural areas, and urban environments. Um, and so how all those things come together is, is the most interesting thing to us. So the first project I want to show is not actually a building, it's a book. And so some of our work, a lot of our work is generated um, because we want to have an impact on our society, on our cities. And this book was to raise public awareness about um, the effects of reversing the Chicago River, which was, it was done about 100 years ago to save drinking water. But, but in fact, the reversal of the river had many unintended consequences. Um, including poor water quality, flooding, um, invasive species coming up the river on the lower right, um, but also these kind of potential of, of what to do with the industrial lands around the river. They, they actually reversed the river by lowering the riverbed through these canals, um, about 26 miles of canals. Um, that, that changed the flow of the river from, from flowing into the Lake Michigan to flowing away from Lake Michigan and down into the Gulf of Mexico. This was a solution that was okay for then, but now you know all of the pollution and uh, sewage that is flushed down the river ends up polluting downstream in the Gulf of Mexico. So there really is a need for a solution. Um, one thing that we did to, to make the book was to interview a lot of people that, that use the river today. And we asked them what the main problem was with, with the river. And they said that uh, it's very hard to access this river. Um, a lot of people don't even know it's there because it's surrounded by private um, land. Even though some of this private land, is the industrial um, uses are moving on, uh, but this land is still hard to get to the river. So we, in the book, we showed a way forward to think about and to imagine this river as a different kind of place. The idea that you would take the uh, water from uh, the lake, but then it could be cleaned and turned into these kind of uh, naturally cleaning lagoons uh, that would also serve a new population and then return this clean water back to the lake. So the book included ideas about how to do this big river unreversal and, and showed 10 steps that would take place over time. But number one step was to 
give people access to this water so they would start to appreciate that it's there. Um, there was an election in Chicago and we got a new mayor and um, he actually read the book and um, he also saw this potential in this riverfront. And so over the next few years, he commissioned a number of projects to be, to be built that would give people access to the river. Um, we did actually two of these projects, um, two boat houses uh, that give youth, students, um, access to this river for the first time. Um, and so we had a very small budget, a very, very small time frame also. Um, and, and what we did was um, we, we went to the, to the river, we saw how people were, were using it, and we were inspired by this rowing. Um, these are photographs from Moybridge who, who did stopgap photography of the uh, rowers. We took the idea of the oar um, and translated that movement into a roof form. Um, so we created these different roofs, a V and an M-shaped roof that bring light in and also warmth into the space where the boats are stored. So here you see the project under construction, done with all straight elements, so, so very inexpensive, but by changing the shape slowly over the space, we get these incredible uh, shaped ceilings. We have an indoor row tank, boat storage, um, and it's suddenly this, this place is highly activated um, and people come here to compete for rowing. You can rent a kayak there. You can go from one boathouse to the next. Um, and, and suddenly this river is becoming a place that um, encourages this kind of relationship between people and this environmental space. It's all done with steel. These are steel Virendil trusses on the second floor of the field house uh, with bent plywood ceiling. So very inexpensive materials, but used to, um, to the best of their ability. They now have programs there for um, disabled veterans, for kids, uh, for, for parents, uh, where, where all the kids from the sit inner city can come together to learn how to row, which is really great because they learn teamwork and, and these kind of things. So uh, we, we wanted to come up with a name for what it means to do this kind of work, like do a book and take part in your city. We came up with the idea of actionable idealism because I think we all feel like we're still idealistic, but we want to get things done. So it's actionable. And I wanted to show another project like this where we, we tried to integrate very closely nature and ecology within the city um, and bring people together. So th this project is called the Nature Boardwalk at Lincoln Park Zoo. And it's um, on a site that was formerly a, a pond uh, that was about three feet deep. And this pond was kind of a representation of nature. Not, it was just for looks, let's say. Um, and over the years, it what fell into disrepair um, and the, the, the zoo came to us and asked us to design a pavilion to, you know, to make it a popular place. But instead of designing the pavilion, we, we thought we really have to do something with the ecology, with the pond itself. So in this case, we turned this pond into a very diverse, biodiverse habitat by making it deeper and changing all the plantings around it. Uh, working very closely with hydrologists and landscape architects um, to make it into a place that actually supports uh, life and also does the work of infrastructure. So it's actually a, a stormwater retention pond. It, it holds water out of the storm sewer system so that it can, uh, so that the city can handle this, this water. Um, you can see now that this, over the years, this place has become more and more uh, alive. Um, and it has actually inspired um, a group of scientists to come and, and they started a new organization. The new organization is called um, the Urban Wildlife Institute. And so they're using this place to measure 
the biodiversity in the city. Um, these are two screens that show uh, measurements of this biodiversity. On the left is for turtles, different types of turtles that are now able to live there. And on the right is the number of bird species that they have seen um, in the area. So it's supporting um, this rookery of um, black crown night herons that went from something like 40 pair, 40 pair to 400 pair <laughs> since the project was built. Um, and also wildlife, like larger mammals. <laughs> and these are taken in a night camera. You have um, skunks on the left and coyotes on the right. And now they, they know that there's about 2,000 coyotes living within the city limits of Chicago. And th this is a very good sign because it, it shows that the, uh, the range of wildlife is becoming more robust within the city too, so not in the rural areas. Then we wanted to design a pavilion that would be really gorgeous and fun. Uh, we used bent wood elements for this lamellas here. Um, they're bent in two directions. So this, this creates an arch and then uh, the cladding over the arch is done with fiberglass. What's really interesting though is that the pavilion started to become used for more things than we originally thought. So originally we thought it was for education, uh, but, but now it's being used for all kinds of interactive events like dance. Um, it's become a place for yoga. This started just naturally, people started doing yoga here and now they have classes. But what was really the most interesting was to me was that people started to use it for getting married and having wedding photos taken, so engagement photos. And these are just, literally taken off the internet but there's it's like so if architecture can create relationships this one is really making people fall in love I guess <laughs> and, um, but what's good about a place like this is it, it is connecting people to each other and to their environment and that's why um, something like this um, Dene en Blanc we didn't plan to, this to happen but it, it happened there so we take our cues from ecologists. And ecology is a field that, that sprang up in the, in the 70s, but the, they don't study individual animal species on their own. They study the relationships between different um, animals and their environment. So I think that's a great metaphor for what an architect should do, is to study how your building is creating a relationship between people and their environment. And so at this point, you know, we thought that it's going to be difficult to continue, to, well, it's going to be difficult to, um, to make people get together in this time that we're in right now where there's a very um, polarized division between uh, left and right and um, we have a difficulty getting along. And so we, we have started doing more temporary exhibitions as well as projects like this um, in order to encourage people to get to know people that are not like them. So to encourage people to come together. So events and exhibitions. One of these ex exhibitions we recently completed this summer in the National Building Museum. Um, it's, a, it's a large building in, in Washington, D.C that has the most enormous atrium in it. When you're inside this atrium, you cannot hear someone talking to you who's like two feet away. <laughs> um, and so our idea here was to make these kind of sound domes uh, that would make it possible to have um, events, music, uh, lectures, and, and conversations. Um, and so this is the tallest structure ever built inside this space. It's about 60 feet high, um, and it is done with paper tubes. So it's, it's creating a, a structure out of something um, very simple and recyclable. Um, but of course, this had never been done before, so we, we had to really do a lot of rigorous testing on these tubes. Um, they're done with sl slotted connections, so um, kind of like 
the, the Charles and Ray Eames cards, you know, where you connect slotted. Um, but we had to test these connections and, and crush it until we could prove to ourselves and to our engineers and to the client that it would work. These are mock-ups of the domes. Um, and there you can see the final domes. So it's all paper, but the last piece of paper is a silver piece of paper, and the first piece of paper is pink. And so that's how you get the color um, inside the dome. Um, these, this place, they had programs here as well, but um, it became a place for yoga. <laughs> but not that all of our buildings are for yoga, but it seems to be happening. And this one was really, it's almost a mecca for yoga. People were coming here. Um, but also they had dance parties and music inside. Um, and really, for this summertime, just uh, two months, um, people coming together into this space. So um, I think it's a very good example of that idea of creating relationships. Um, another exhibition we did just recently at the Chicago Architecture Biennial uh, was to create, we were asked to create a stage for the artist Nick Cave, who is a, a visual artist who makes these incredible sound suits uh, very elaborate and then he does performances with dancers uh, and we wanted to make the stage out of uh, a stage that people could interact with and so the stage is actually these buoys stage buoys uh, that we created which are kind of like weebly wobbly <laughs> uh, buoys that we had to understand this equilibrium of the material the weight um, as you can see, some of them don't work. It really had to be adjusted to, um, to be fast enough and slow enough and soft enough and, and interactive enough. Um, you can see that, you know, it could be, you could imagine this could be very dangerous, this kind of thing. Um, but anyway, we, we were able to design it so that it could be used by kids and adults. Um, and everyone really had a great time with this uh, material. Um, and so after the, the performance, this, the audience members could come up and interact with it and get to know each other. So this was another example of how does design and architecture bring people together um, to connect them to themselves and to the environment. I want to switch to a bigger scale now because um, one of the hardest things, I think, is connecting people in tall buildings because tall buildings are, they could be seen as isolating and, and um, introverted, I guess. Um, we were interested in tall buildings because, like people said, we're from Chicago and it's surrounded by tall buildings. Um, but also the fact that in American cities, um, which tend to sprawl out with these suburban uh, landscapes, we, we, we saw a very strong value in bringing people together in the city in a more dense, um, compact arrangement. So for one tall building on the left-hand side of the equation here, the Aqua Tower, um, it takes up um, so much less footprint um, than the, the suburban pattern on the right, but it also means that each household that lives inside the tall building has a smaller carbon footprint as well because you don't have to drive everywhere to drop off your kids or just get some milk. You, you, you can walk to work. And so that's why we found this an interesting building type. And also it seemed that there wasn't very much, there wasn't very interesting tall buildings going on when, when we received this commission. As I said, I mean, the only, the only way people relate to each other in a tall building is when they get inside the elevator. And then it's usually pretty awkward and no one wants to talk to each other. <laughs> um, um, so we designed this tower, which is called the Aqua Tower. It's 82 stories high. Um, it has a hotel, condominiums, and apartments, so mixed use. Um, and it's, it's um, about, let's see, uh, it was about 380,000 square feet, which is 38,000 square meters. Yeah, 30. Yeah. Three, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is 38,000 square meters. So, and the, the interesting thing here is um, 
every floor plate is different in this building. And the reason uh, why, we, we were really trying to make a building that had an inside and an outside where you could be part of the tower community but also part of the city at the same time. And again, we were inspired by this landscape idea, the idea of topography, where you have hills and valleys and lakes um, and this variety, like what we saw coming over to um, uh, uh, Riconti from Rome. Um, and how could that be translated into a building? Um, so we created this topographic um, vertical topography. Um, and then uh, each of those hills related to uh, specific views in the city. Um, and then the idea of cutting these topographies into 82 floors is what gives the, the variety of terraces. Um, this is an image inside a wind tunnel, which you have to test. Every tall building you have to test inside this wind tunnel to see how it, it reacts with wind, but also what happens to the area around it. And what we found with the different uh, floor plates was that it started to confuse the wind. And so this, this makes the, ter the terrace, the balcony, uh, more comfortable for a longer period of time in the year, so not so windy. Um, and it also, because these balconies are not just stacked up in a row, it allows you to see your neighbors. And so that was something that, that we had to really try to get our client to accept because they were thinking every, everything wants to be private up there. Um, so you can't, you can't look into your neighbor's apartment, but you can see them obliquely above and below. And then we, we found out and we heard that pe people were starting to get to know each other on the front facade of the building. Um, and it has become... It's one of the more social buildings. It became the favorite building of the University of Chicago grad students that like to live there. Um, it's, it's a building where people have started to form uh, clubs and groups within the building. They started their own community garden. So the building is having this impact. We wanted to take this idea. I think the balcony is a great place to start looking at the um, oops start looking at the uh, tall building um, it, it's it's great because it, it, it allows people to step outside and ha it's like a threshold that the, just like you would have on your front door and so we wanted this this uh, balcony to perform better um, than the aqua tower so the next step was really thinking about this smaller building and this is a very um, it's, it's a building that was designed to be very affordable. Um, and here we created balcony stems. Stems, like a, a stem of a plant, where all of the weight, the, the forces go, go down into the ground, and you're able to separate the balcony from the inside. This is, this is important in a cold climate because you, you want to um, improve the performance, environmental performance of the building. So this, this view during construction, you can see the green bars are on the exterior uh, balcony and the, the, the gray bars are on the interior and you have in between a thermal break in between. But the idea of this, this balcony stem is to create these very dynamic spaces inside and outside the apartment where you can see your neighbors once you step outside. Um, and together, the, these balconies create this incredible, almost like Escher-esque um, vista from, from inside and when you're on them, um, where you can see people, other people on the facade, you can get to know your neighbor um, and, and you, can, you can have this kind of dynamic uh, building even if it's um, a relatively low cost housing. Now I wanna shift to a competition that um, we recently did in Europe for the, the Tour Montparnasse, um, which you might know this tower in Paris, uh, built in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, it's a 58-story tower that's in uh, the area of Montparnasse of Paris. The building um, was found to have asbestos in it. Um, it has a very poor environmental performance and it was time to rethink this building. So the owners 
there's 70 different um, owners of this office tower. They decided to have a competition to reinvent the Tour Montparnasse. I'm dying because we actually got, we, we were in the finals and we, we got second place. Ah. <laughs> ah. It still hurts. Ah. Um, but I, I'm so happy that I can show you the project, you know, for one of the first times to show this project to the public. Um, um, I think it should have won. It's a fabulous project. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So the problem of this place, uh, this whole area in Montparnasse, you might have seen it. It, it was all cleared out. Um, um, and there were multiple levels built in this area, but it wasn't very successful um, in terms of, people really didn't like this place in, in Paris, they still don't. It has very uncomfortable exterior spaces. There's a mall, there's a small office building, and then the tower. So the competition was limited to this, um, just the tower, which is this footprint here, and up to this, this kind of triangular site. Uh, and, and the idea for eventually is that they will re, redevelop the entire plaza and the mall and everything else around it. Um, but for the sake of the competition, we were just looking at the tower. Um, so our approach, you know, starting thinking about environment, thinking about uh, this, this windy plaza, we started looking at the shape of the tower and, you know, having this familiarity with doing towers and understanding wind. Um, we know that the wind is much faster at, at, on tall buildings up at the top, um, but also it, the wind impacts the area around uh, the tower as well. So if you're on the ground, we found, we suspected that the concave area of this tower was pushing, uh, scooping the wind down to uh, the plaza. And it turned out that it was true. So this is a, a, a computer fluid dynamic model where you can see the red part is showing the, the strength of the wind. So mainly coming from the upper left hand corner in this image and, and pushing down onto the plaza. Um, so our idea really started with this very pragmatic thing, but it, it turned out to um, help immensely with many aspects of this tower. First of all, we, we thought of filling in these, these two gaps, the kind of Pac-Man mouth um, on the end of the tower. Um, and this, this shape is much better in terms of reducing the turbulence on the tower. And one of the more recent discoveries in wind design um, and you might see this in, in future airplane wings and, and wings uh, and uh, blades on wind turbines, is to add bumps. Because the bumps um, do a couple of things. They, they, they make the, uh, they reduce turbulence also, which is why you'll start seeing them on these other um, objects. Um, but we thought that the bumps, by introducing bumps, we could also introduce bay windows so people from inside could actually have um, a nice view, almost like a corner office, um, all over the building. These are some very inspirational f for us. This um, uh, this engineer called Etienne Jules Marais, who designed the first wind tower, actually in France. So, and he also did a lot of photography of the stopgap kind of photography to study motion. And so, these were kind of things that were in the back of the mind, and you will maybe see some relationship to this. Uh, we actually did wind tunnel testing on various shapes for the competition. This is a wind tunnel in um, Canada where we oftentimes test our designs. Um, you can see how you set up the, the model on, on the left-hand side. You set up your, your tower and you represent the area around the tower, like the scale of the buildings um, in Paris. And then they, this, this turntable rises up into the tunnel itself where wind is actually um, shot across the, the tunnel from one end to the other. And so here you can see, um, this is um, me inside the tunnel with um, our, one of our fabulous wind engineers, Peter Heppel, and um, the engineer that runs the wind tunnels. Um, so we were actually able to prove to ourselves and adjust our design to, to respond to this wind. Um, here you can see the, the strategy, you know, many towers are going to need to have this done. I mean, they will need to be reclad and they will need new skin. 
So we really, in this case, uh, thought about how one could do that in a, in a prefabricated way to reduce the time of the disturbance. Um, and the, the result of this, these different types of bays create this incredible te texture on the building uh, where there's a, a thousand belvedere's, you know, for people to, even people that are not the, uh, the CEO of the office can have a corner window. Um, and there's many benefits to this as well from inside to out. Um, and the, this horizontal texture, what I think really works is that we're suddenly bringing the human scale of the, the kind of housemanian, the, the baron, houseman who produced you know, all of these types of buildings in Paris was looking at the horizontality and I think we start to introduce that. So from an environmental performance uh, standard, we have a double skin with a, a blind in between, uh, which with the bay windows allows you to cut out the glare while maintaining views uh, out of the other side of the bay window. Um, and then these lamellas rotate um, and they are able to screen out the, the harsh uh, glaring light and also produce this kind of metallic image. So we were really trying to bring work at these two scales of, of bringing the human scale to the tower and bringing really a sense of this monumentality um, to the building, which is, which is so important in Paris um, and, and in other cities where you have this kind of need for the tower to do something on a bigger scale. Uh, this is a view from Rue de Rennes. Uh, this is a view from the Parc du Luxembourg, um, which this shimmering quality that comes from the environmental approach. Structurally, we need to carry a much heavier facade, so we're introducing new steel columns that are sistered onto uh, the old columns. So we call them the sister columns. Um, and, and these columns can come down and flare out to avoid the existing foundations. And then um, we packed in a lot of different uses, like a hotel, an observatory, uh, retail. Um, we have cafes, clubs and a conference center, all having their, their main entry on the ground floor. Um, by carving the plaza, we are able to bring daylight um, and views and, and a kind of ecological landscape in and around the tower base, which will also help to reduce the wind. From uh, afar, we can see this new top, which is, which is a kind of a, a cascading garden um, with um, a new program at the top, almost like a park raised up in the sky for, for the city. Um, and the very top, this structure, this carole, uh, is a steel structure that is mounted to the, ba to the core of the building and provides this shelter for a, a, a winter garden at the top that could be used as a public space. Um, so now I'm just going to play this movie and let you see what it looks like um, and um, this m almost a moving, moving motion quality to the, to the light for this building. This is the, the kind of stepping of the facade uh, that gives us uh, the, this human scale. Um, and then zooming into kind of at the plaza level where um, you can see that it's a reinvented plaza with a with lot more green integrated um, with much more airy spaces and public spaces up and in, into the building. We, we introduced a kind of a, a co-working space um, at the base which is shown here. Um, gyms and a, a transportation center where people can uh, tr ride bikes, park them at work. And I think this, this texture really, really is helping both like from the wind standpoint but also um, from the interior standpoint where you can have more like an open office, a two-story height office, um, the hotel space where windows come all the way down. 
I think the mixed use aspect will also help enliven that plaza because people will be coming there uh, for all these different uses. Um, At the observatory, several levels of these decks that allow them to have private events and public events simultane simultaneously. It's got the best views, really, from the top of this tower, best views of Paris. And I know it's like, it's, it's so sad that this is not going to be built, <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, I, was, I, I do have, like, there's silver lining is with tall buildings, a lot of times um, the developments that you do during the design are applicable to other projects with similar climates. So I think, you know, we, we made a lot of advances here that we will be able to incorporate into future work. If there's any possibility of building a tower in Rome, I think it, <laughs> this would be perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the good news is we have um, a tower under construction right now and you know I've been talking a lot about how to connect people to each other and to the city and this one does it in a really different way and I want to explain that it's a this, this tower is um, over 300 meters so it's ca categorized as a super tall tower um, but you can see that it steps down so there's only one part that's very very tall um, it's located on this axis. This is in Chicago on the Lakeshore Drive. Um, and it's also part of this river, um, river walk. So it has these kind of two different scales. Um, and maybe you can see with our towers, a lot, I think we approach it in a different way. We're always starting with the smaller element and then moving out to the bigger, um, as opposed to trying to just come up with a profile or something. And so with this tower, we started with this element called a frustum. And a frustum um, is a sloping geometry. It's kind of a truncated pyramid. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting geometry because what it does for the views and what it does for the corners of the building. It's also a geometry found in nature. Um, <laughs> but. Um, um, but we see here in the building that suddenly, because of this stepping in and stepping out here, we suddenly have eight corners per floor um, as opposed to four. And so that helps the, the, it helps the interior get light from different directions, de natural daylight. And we're also working here with an interesting glass technology to take uh, the glass from um, a light uh, glass to a higher performing glass as the footprint gets smaller. Um, and then um, that alternates to give this building a kind of woven impression. But the biggest thing that I think structurally that it does in the city is create a connection. And so by doing the three stems here, these three stems, we're able to lift the center stem um, and allow a public connection between the park and the river. And so um, you can see here, this is, this is the situation with the Chicago River at one level. It's kind of like the Tiber, it's down, down a ways. Um, and then there's a, an elevated street. Um, and on both of those levels, there'll be connections, public access underneath and through the tower. So instead of a wall here, we will have an, a portal um, between. Um, and that's because the cores of the tower are on the outside. Now this tower, um, luckily got designed, financed, and is in construction. So in, by 2019, we should see p this, this um, tower completed. Um, it's very close to where the aqua tower is, which is back here, you can see it in the view. Um, and then this other tower over here called the Trump Tower, but we won't talk about that one. <laughs> um, so, so this tower is on the Chicago River. It's the Vista Tower um, to be completed soon, and I hope that um, you can all come see that one. Now, I, I want to, in the final couple projects, to show you a smaller scale project. Uh, I think it's a scale of project that a lot of that we can, as architects, relate to. 
Um, this is the Social Justice Center at Kalamazoo College. Um, it, it's a very, it's 10,000 square feet or 10,000 divided by 1,000 square meters. Um, and it is um, located on this small campus in Michigan where the pink dot is. Um, they wanted us to design a place where uh, students could do social justice projects. So basically working on um, human rights, LGBT issues, um, all the issues around social justice. Um, and they had a very strong program there. Um, but the planning of these events, the planning of a march, the planning of a protest, oftentimes takes place in a hidden place, like a basement of a church or a kitchen, around a kitchen table. And so the, the, the areas that we decided to study were these community uh, buildings around the world, because these are community meeting houses um, in, in many different cultures. They kind of have a similar theme. People sit and face inward at, toward each other, so they face each other. Uh, there's oftentimes a hearth, a fireplace, or water, or light in the center. Um, the Mesa Verde I showed you in the beginning, um, it had these kivas, or, or meeting houses within them that you went down into, but um, in the archaeological um, research, they found that they were oftentimes surrounding a hearth with, with seating all around. Um, the, the people from the, uh, Kalamazoo told us, the students told us they wanted a place um, where they could cook food and have meetings and, and the faculty wanted a place where they would be warm and welcoming. So we, we actually have this kind of place in the building, a hearth, a kitchen, and it works for these, both the small meeting gatherings and also these kind of much bigger gatherings where they can um, have seminars and conferences and events, all gathering around the hearth. Um, the interiors are very light. Um, we used a lot of um, natural materials. Even wood from the site was used for um, furniture, and these are cork interiors. Um, and the idea is that to be very proud about social justice work and to connect with these large windows to the outside, like to the landscape, but also to the campus and to the neighborhood around it. But I think what's interesting in this project is, is really that the materiality of the project also brings people together. Um, we found this wood that was a very rot-resistant wood, insect-resistant wood, and stumbled upon um, the use of this wood in a very interesting way in this case, a hundred-year-old barn that had used wood as masonry. So instead of bricks, using, using logs. Um, and we, we were able to find uh, a few people that knew how to do this. And so we learned ourselves. These are studio gang members and, and our contractors learning how to use the wood in this way. Um, and we thought it would be very important to understand this and bring it into the 21st century. Um, the reason why is this, um, this kind of technique is very good for the environment. It's, uh, the, the trees absorb carbon when they're growing up, um, and then they store that carbon, so they're sequestering the carbon in the wall. And it produces this incredible texture, uh, a super insulated wall, so essentially, it's like taking cars off the road uh, to, to build in this way. Um, and then it has this aging quality that, that brings different, uh, the different exposures will have different qualities on the three sides of the building. Um, so yeah, so this really came out really nicely. And now um, this population, the, they started the program of social justice on Kalamazoo. Uh, they had something like um, 10 scholars um, working there, and, and now that number has increased dramatically, and they have more people applying to the program. And in a sense, it's, it's, the building is supporting this expansion of social justice, which makes us happy. Um, and uh, another, finally, the last building project is the Writer's Theater, which is um, a small community theater 
north of the city of Chicago. And, and what I wanted to talk about with this project is really that um, in this small community, it was very car-oriented. Um, people really didn't walk much, and there wasn't a lot of social interaction. So here we tried to look at the past and look at what, what theater was capable of doing for the city. And we found these examples of, of theaters without walls uh, that were really exciting uh, from different times. In Shakespeare's time, they often did these courtyards that were um, open air um, with the stage right in the middle. So, so this theater has a 250 seat venue and a 100 seat venue. And we thought the place to do this kind of um, quasi theater would be in the lobby. And so we, we placed this lobby on the, out, the outside corner of the building with the idea of creating a space that could have impromptu uh, meetings, could house conversations after the show. Uh, one of the things the theater does is, is introduce some very uh, you know, controversial materials for people to absorb. And so to have a place to have a conversation after the show was really important to them. Um, you can see the plan here, so the, the 250 seat venue, the 100 seat venue, the rehearsal space, and then how the, the theater the lobby on the corner acts as this other venue. Uh, we used interesting wood technology. We tried to convince our client that it was in line with the Tudor uh, tradition, which is um, you know just a modern day and more innovative use of wood. Uh, which they agreed with. Um, and then uh, we really wanted to test the wood intention. So using the wood um, to hang a balcony around the structure. So what we did here was we used a Virendil truss of wood um, and the beams come over the top and then these wood battens support a walkway around it. So you can see here the design. Um, and so just doing this was hugely difficult because it's not allowed to use this wood in this way in, in the building codes. Um, but we knew it would work and wood has all these properties. Um, we had a very interesting detail for the connection of, of this hanging joint. Um, we were able to find a, a, a guild. It's, it's essentially, it's a, it's a guild of carpenters that, that knew how to do this. Um, they used both computer equipment and hand made these things and they allowed us to come out to their space and test this so that we could prove that it worked. So this is a, a mock-up where you know, you're pulling the, uh, the test piece apart in tension until it fails. The good thing is it didn't ever fail. <laughs> and also the, this frame around it started to fail so we had to stop. Um, and then you can see this um, technique of creating the cavities in the beam to accept these cat's paws. We call the detail a cat's paw. Um, so instead of bolting through this material, you're actually adding material in and you get this, this cat's paw that is the, the connection point. And um, it, it was a, a really interesting place. I learned a lot about wood there and they also invited us out for um, like the weekend and I learned how to throw an ax over there. <laughs> um, and then this is uh, showing the, the cat's paws as it was seen in construction. So it produces this thing that I think people can relate to and they see the material, they see the force in the material and this outdoor walkway that surrounds the lobby um, can act as a place to walk during uh, intermission you can open the windows and connect to the, to the indoor-outdoor space of the lobby. And the, these giant doors, you can see how the hanging is working. We have no structure in this, in this facade. It's so transparent because uh, we're hanging everything from the top, uh, which produces this very lantern-like effect um, when, you, when you see it and you come upon this in, in the nighttime landscape. So finally, uh, just to wrap up, uh, just talk about this project, which is kind of another book project to, to bookend uh, the lecture called Polis Station. So this is a project, it's a book, it's a, an exhibition without a client, uh, self-initiated 
uh, to address a very serious problem in the United States and elsewhere, uh, which is the, the conflict between um, the police and the community members. And so uh, this is something that has been in the news day and day and night, and we wanted to think about in terms of architecture uh, to see if architecture could add something positive to this conversation. It happened that um, we were working on a fire station in New York, in Brooklyn, um, and we noticed that the, the firemen and the fire station were very open to the community. And they, the firemen have a very good relationship with the community as well, and with each other. Um, so why is this not working with police stations, which tend to be fortresses? Um, and you can see here that we, we look, did a survey of the police stations in Chicago, and they were all built around the same time, about 15 years ago. And so the city was trying to treat all the communities equally, which is a good thing, but they didn't really ask the communities what they needed. And so um, these police stations are really thought of as fortresses. And in, the, in certain neighborhoods, people are very scared of the police and going anywhere near the police station even to report a crime. And so in this, again, we look backwards first to history, and it turns out that um, police originally came from the community that they were policing. They were the neighbors. And there weren't any buildings. They just used these little huts for warming themselves. Uh, but they were just people that took turns um, keeping the neighborhood safe. Uh, but when, when things uh, advanced and they were started to introduce cars and technology, um, there was a break with this tradition of a community policing, and c the police ended up moving away from the communities they were policing and driving to work. So they no longer know the community that they're policing. And then the police station started to become a fortress surrounded by a parking lot in America. And so th this further separate the police station from the community. Uh, here's the one we looked at. It's a a station in North Lawndale in Chicago surrounded by this giant parking lot from like, and then the roads are so wide here too. It's, there really isn't a connection to this police station. Um, and so we thought if we're gonna look at this building type, we need to ask the police and the community members both what they think could improve it, what could improve the, the architecture to bring people together so that they would have more casual interactions and perhaps get to know each other. So we did a, a meeting with inviting the police and the community members. This is our office um, conducting the meeting and asking them what they would like in their police station. And what was really interesting was they, they told us that um, they had lots of ideas about what they could put inside. Um, everything from computer stations to um, one, one a gentleman suggested having a barber shop in there. Um, the idea being that if you could have, you know, cops need a haircut and community needs a haircut, you're gonna start talking to each other. Um, so the idea that the building would no longer be this fortress and start to be opened up to the community. About this time, we decided to show this project at the Architecture Biennale two years ago. Um, and we, we were able to, when we, we started talking about it, suddenly a lot of people wanted to invest in this idea. Um, and so uh, before the Biennale opened, we were able to um, identify on this police parking, this, this idea of this whole regeneration of the community, but we were able to identify a piece of the parking lot where we could uh, introduce sports courts, a uh, basketball court because both the cops and the kids like basketball. And we were able to raise enough money to get this done. So again, it's like this actionable idealism that it's like, it, it's not really a designed object yet, but it is, the design is like bringing all of these ideas together and connecting the dots. Um, and then after about a year, we interviewed the community members and they told us that they were formerly, they were scared of the police station, and now they prefer their kids to play there. So it's like a small step, but something that I think architecture has the capacity to do. And now the cops actually have basketballs inside the station that kids can borrow. 
So they're having that interaction as well. So in the future, maybe there would be a community room, a place for a barbershop, a place to get money from an ATM or um, get other services from the city on the public side of the station. And therefore, like creating this more of a connection, more of a social connection between these people and each other and to their environment. With that, I, I thank you very much. That's the end. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, così, grazie, thank you. This is the, the, the ideal architecture. The ideal architecture lecture. Uh, we, we, we really saw how an architecture works in the 21st century, I think. Uh, penso che possiamo chiedere a Gini se può accettare qualche domanda, se avete domande. Se no, comincio io, eh. ci sono sempre un sacco io. Oh, yeah. This one. I'll give it to you. Alex. How do you do this like this? Yeah, otherwise. Okay. Question from the UK. Compliments on a great uh, presentation. Fascinating, <laughs> educational, <laughs> wonderful. Um, you use a lot of natural light in your schemes, which I found very interesting. Do you work with lighting designers for the artificially lit spaces of your projects? Um, we, we actually, we do many different combinations of, of working interior, developing our own um, ideas for natural daylighting and, and, day, and artificial lighting for schemes, but we also work with lighting designers and with uh, lighting providers, companies that can also assist in the early design phases. So yes, but the light is very important inside the space because it makes people feel connected um, and it's, it's, it's one of the tools that we have in our toolbox to use. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Prego. Intrepidi studenti di Ascoli. While, while we wait for the students from Ascoli to wake up, uh, Jeannie, from, being from Chicago, um, such a strong architectural heritage. Do you feel and do your architectural peers feel any sort of responsibility to carry on the, the legacy of Chicago architecture? Obviously you're doing a good job, but can you share a little bit about what that means? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a great question from someone who knows Chicago. And um, I think the, the history of Chicago architecture has to do with um, both structural innovation, I would say, and, and expression of structure um, through the building, um, expression of materials as well. In fact, at the Illinois Institute of Technology, um, it's ba the, the education, the school, is actually a little bit like the Bauhaus in that in the beginning, students work with a specific material. So they start with um, a wood building, then they move to masonry, then they go to steel and then concrete. So, so each of the studios is taught through the material. And so I think that, uh, that was one of the first places that um, I actually taught and my partner Mark here, who's attending today, also taught there. And there was a, a, a sense of, of you know, express, expressing what the material is doing. Um, so I think that was, that comes through very strongly in our work. Um, and I think that is also part of the DNA of the city of Chicago. So if you have a concrete building, it looks like a concrete building. Or a steel building, it looks like a steel building. And each of those materials are used for what they can offer uh, the structure. Um, I think with, with our work, it's um, maybe it doesn't appear to be as rational because we have integrated organic um, form, but it actually is quite rational. Like concrete is fluid, so we can do curvature with it. It, it lends itself to the curvature. Um, I think wood, it works well in tension. Let's use it in tension. So I think you start to see that we're exploiting the qualities of the material a lot in the work.
I have a question. So, um, if we look at Chicago and we look for some other uh, cities in, uh, in the United States, like New York or like Boston, in which there is uh, Charles Rivers, that is a uh, cutting Boston in two sides, as well as Hudson, uh, that is uh, cutting uh, New York. Do you get uh, any inspiration for uh, these uh, uh, two cities in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the job that you're doing along the river of Chicago, or what? <laughs> um, no, it was really, I think we, the, these, we're very interested in ecology of city, right? And so um, even a city that has a very built, built constructed um, mineral quality, um, there, a river in a city is um, a kind of a, an eco highway. It could be. And so I think we're in interested in how, does the how can a river do more than what it, you know, we, the, the 20, let's see, the, the industrial city thinks of the river as a means of transport only. And, but it is, it is so much more than that. And so I, I think in, in all these cities, there's some very interesting projects that could develop, including Rome, about how the river could be reimagined, not just exploited commercially, but, you know. Even more, this, 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 this region, it's organized by rivers. Yes. You have parallel rivers every 30 kilometers, mm -hmm. and that's, that's yeah. in valleys, and that's yeah. how the whole thing works what, here. And I noticed on the way here, um, we were driving here over the mountains, in, in all of the valleys, the trees are a different color, like, yeah. like bright colors right now. Um, so you, you can even see that, the, the hydrology, by just looking at the landscape. You yeah, see it. nice. Prego. No, bye, bye. Okay. Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting speech. Um, I really appreciated your definition of uh, actionable idealism in uh, architecture. And I would say that it is strictly, uh, closely connected to community participation uh, in the um, design process. So could you explain us a little bit more how this process is organized? Uh, organized? So how do you um, decide who has to take part into this, uh -huh. this. process? It's a, it's, it's, Thank you. It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, you know, like in architecture school, we're never taught how to engage with people, right? It's not, um, not typically something that we learn, but as architects, it's a skill we really need to have. So I, I think like we should start introducing this as, as um, part of the architecture curriculum. Um, but what we found in our practice in, is there's almost, it's like a continuum of engagement, like from minimal, you know, like maybe you do a public meeting to inform people. The informing is the least amount. And then you can get more and more um, um, engagement until you have, on the other end of the spectrum would be like empowering people um, through the work. And so, uh, you know, of course you need to talk with your client about what kind of engagement do they want to see? And maybe they don't want it at all, but we know that the project goes much better, smoother, and there's more success chance if you have the communication. Um, and so you can design the process. And that's what we found. So we've done it very many different ways from, w with the Polis Station project, like I said, we didn't have a client because we didn't want to, to, to think about this problem. We didn't want to work for the police and we didn't want to work for the community. We wanted to you know, be objective and see what, what could happen. So, so there we, um, we worked with um, someone who's, who's a facilitator who helped us get the right people at the meeting. And then we, we asked three questions and they all had to do with design and what was incredible was suddenly the police and the community members who were, you know, don't like each other at all, they were fighting in the beginning. But when you start talking about design, it, it somehow like lets people say what they think and it, it was, suddenly was a very productive conversation. 
Right. So, so yeah, it, I think there's different ways to do it. Bravo, Good right. question. In your, in your approach, there is a strong relationship between science and architecture. Uh, is there the same approach uh, uh, with social sciences and architecture, or is it a matter of social feeling and... Uh, mm. Mm. The... Yes. Um, I think, you know, you, you correctly recognize that, that um, we're very interested in science, the meeting of art and science, I guess. Um, with the social, um, social science and anthropology area, um, I think it, there's a very strong interest also. For example, um, one of the recent um, findings that we've been looking at lately is this rise in loneliness as a, it's an, a real thing that is in a, a very strong rise in loneliness, not only in older people, but also millennials who are more connected than ever. So why is this happening? And then, um, so I think, you know, like we're, we're always looking for these academic papers and research papers to help us understand what, what are the issues that we should be addressing. Um, and we have a lot of relationships with people study outside architecture in these different categories, usually through universities. Uh, like uh, we work a lot with the University of Chicago who has everything on their faculty from anthropology, social science, economics, except for architecture. <laughs> so so it, we, we like working with them because they're interested in what we're doing and, and we can often have those relationships. These things that Jeannie said now on the relationship between architecture and loneliness, I think they should be I framed. I have a more boring question, if you're <laughs> ready to. I mean, I'm impressed that if we had this series of lectures 20 years ago, we would see architects that show a lot of projects where the task is to look always the same. No? Mm -hmm. to have an established language mm -hmm. and to make yourself immediately recognizable. Uh, and this was very much the 20th century. No? Mm -hmm. uh, we had a number of architects here, which we like a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that these architects, you very much, mm -hmm. but also other, mm -hmm. I mean, we had David, we had yeah. uh, Snohetta, we had uh, well, some of the Italian architects we like. There is this idea that architecture can change. Mm -hmm. uh, can change, you don't need to look always the same. You, you don't need to be like a tailor mm -hmm. to be chosen for a, for a project. And I think this is extremely interesting and this tells us a lot about our time. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, I mean, did you ever realize it or, or yeah. thought about this, this kind of proteiforme, no? Condition mm -hmm. of architecture today. Mm. It's, it's a good question, I think. Um, for us, for me, um, the interest in materials and, and their qualities um, is one driver of how the building will look. Is it made of wood or is it concrete or steel? But also, think about the different scales that we're working at. I mean, it's very different. I don't, I don't think about, you know, when you th we're thinking about an 82-story tower, the way you perceive that building and the form and the materiality is very different than a small building. And I don't know if we're working at vastly different, if all of us architects are working at vastly different scales now, yeah. and, and that's part of it. Um, but but I, I think there is, there's something in common with the, with the projects. Yes. But it's not just the formal, um, it's repetition. Not, it's not it's, the need of a style. Right, yes. It, it is more like, and we try to hold off, I would say in a process, hold off the form as, so that we can do more, more um, understanding of the project, really what is this project about and the question that it a answers. What, what is the question that we're trying to address and hold off the form as long as possible, even though it's not always possible. <laughs> Because sometimes you're asked to produce, you know, a form immediately. But, you know, it, it, as long as you can hold that off, 
do your research and then start to make like you know it, then it just flows out because you have so many so many aspirations at that point well, you know when when Italo Calvino was invited was Harvard to give yes. the six lectures yes. he, he, he wrote the, he wrote only five of the six lectures that were like lightness transparency yes. about literature of course yes but he missed he died before writing the last one and the last one Consistency. So yes. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. Indeed. Ragazzi, anche domande semplici. Anche in italiano. Ho visto che molti suoi progetti hanno avuto un gran successo a livello sociale. Many of your projects have been very successful socially, but in the UK and in Italy we've seen projects that did work in the same way. What's the secret? Um, well, I think, you know, maybe the answer would be um, start with the, something on the inside first, then move to the outside. This is just a you know, I haven't thought about this too long, but, but if, if you can create a space that is supporting the, the program, the, the relationships of the people inside, the inside to outside, and then, just, so that there's some idea there. I think a lot of times people start with just the outside aesthetic. <laughs> and it, so if it doesn't resonate with, and, and also knowing who the building is for, trying to understand who it's for, what do they do, um, and and the, that approach will make a building last longer, I think. Um, the answer is also in what she said before, the ability to consider the third element, that's people, the people that will use those spaces. Even in the market region, we have those types of buildings, like in Fermo, there is a building designed by a famous architect. There is, there is not far from here. You go to Fermo, yeah. there is this beautiful bus, bus uh -huh. station yeah. that, that would never open. No? And, and, and you have many of these stories in our country. So, so the, the, yeah. the answer is already what you said before yeah. about the discussion with the community. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is... What getting the people, the people to... Yeah, so in, in that case, it never got finished because people said, stop, no. Well, it got finished, it. but then they weren't able to use it. Ah. I mean, altre domande? Vediamo. Amando via, eh? Poi non è che torna domani. But next time you come, you come to our school. Okay. Okay? Yes. And I would love to see the projects. Vogliamo, prego. Trentellone, la prossima. Nella tua strategia di progetto in your, uh, hai sempre cercato di in your design strategy you've always tried to involve people listen to their needs and so create strategies that could put these needs into practice but are there other strategies that an architect an architect can follow in order to favor the familiarity of these people of these works that cannot be known by common people like the visibility of the place for example infrastructure connections like roads so what are the other factors in addition to knowing the needs of the people that count for a project so that the project can be successful investigated question I have to yeah. do a, I want to hear your I have to translate I, I, have one I mean I mean, I mean you, spoke, you spoke very clearly on how your buildings are presented to the, com to the community yeah. that physically enter in a relationship yeah. with them but when you do a building you also think of a larger community uh -huh. of people who is going to see it only from the web, for instance, oh, yeah. or people that have to have access to it. I mean, they really have to yeah. choose to go see yes. your build. So, yeah. how, is, how do right. you speak? To, you. How do you build and speak to the yes. world? Yes. Um, so, I hope that you saw in the work that, that 
there is attention to form and to light and to to um, materiality and these are the essential ingredients that make people make people excited to walk out of their way ten miles to go see a building. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it somehow it, it has to be it has to be good on every level. Um, I think one thing is also like um, so. Yes, we rely on photography now to to um, express what the building is to the world that won't ever get there. Um, but so so in photography is um, it's still a main, it's still an essential part of communicating your project to the rest of the of the world, but. I think the the history, the story of the building, the narrative, um, is also a part that that brings people to the building from far away. The, can I can I add something? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, it, it's very sophisticated the way these buildings create desire. Hmm. It's all about desire. You know? So you have to solve the problems, you have to put your program, you have to meet the community, but you need to raise architectural desire. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very surprised, sono sorpreso che nessuno degli studenti presenti domandi per esempio a Gini come ha fatto a farsi prendere a Studio Oma. Non glielo chiedete, eh? How, how did you get to, to, to have an internship at OMA? Oh, what they want to ask yes, oh, yes. Um, you but you, as a yes, I, actually it's, it's even, it's, I was at the GSD, Harvard, um, in my graduate program, and my job was, one of my jobs as a student, I didn't have REM as my teacher in my studio. But I was working in the tech place doing the, this, the, um, the, his lecture, like his slide lecture. <laughs> and he got very angry because I had the light shining down on, it, on him. But, um, but that's how I met him the first time, to, to do his lecture. And I asked him right there, you know, I want to work for you and I'm coming to Europe. Um, he said, well, yeah, when you get there, you can come see me for a job. And so, you know, I did. I literally went to Europe. I was also interviewing at other places too, not only. <laughs> no, no. Um, so I think, you know, I was persistent and I really wanted to do that. I wanted to work for someone that I really respected the work. And so I just did it, you know. Even though I think I'm kind of shy, like in my personality, I used to be shy, <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I still forced myself to you know go after that, and I I was able to get a project. And luckily, I worked on projects at OMA that were being built because it was possible to work in the office for a number of years and only work on competitions. And I love building, so I, I luckily I worked on. Lille, the house in Bordeaux, and the both wow. projects. That wow. Are, yeah. Wow. Grazie. I think they love this, this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Possiamo lasciarla libera? Thank you very much. I Sorry. think it was a wonderful <laughs> <laughs>